All right. We're in Colossians chapter 3. We pretty much finished chapter 2 last week. And um, we noticed that Paul uh, really got into the, uh, this Gnostic, Judaistic, uh, false teaching. Uh, and they appear to have some kind of um, preoccupation with parts of the, the Jewish law, the, the, the feast days, the festivals, the keeping of Sabbaths and new moons he talks about in, in some form of asceticism or denying yourself uh, certain uh, indulgences in this life and certainly under the law of Moses, you know, they dealt with the, uh, the clean and the unclean and that kind of thing. And so, uh, and then also this worship of other heavenly beings besides God, angels, and, and other such uh, principalities and powers as they're referred to. Uh, and then, of course, the Gnostics were very exclusive, exclusive in their... Uh, treatment of other people that uh, you know they had this special knowledge uh, and you kind of put all that together and Paul deals with that pretty straightforward in a straightforward way the Holy Spirit through Paul there in verses 11 through the end of chapter 2 certainly the old law has been done away uh, and uh, they're not to let people judge them uh, in these kinds of matters uh, and certainly not to be going after all of these things but to keep their um, focus on the one who matters, and that's Christ. Uh, and so he really, at this point, um, like in many of Paul's letters, uh, scholars and commentators will say, okay, the first two chapters were the doctrinal section, and, and the next, uh, second two are the practical section. And, and while that is, in, uh, is a generalization and probably true, that certainly doesn't mean that there's nothing practical in the first two chapters or nothing doctrinal uh, in the second two chapters um, because um, the bottom line is practical duties and responsibilities are grounded in doctrine. Uh, you first have to have the teaching before you know how you're supposed to behave and what your responsibilities and duties are. Uh, as Brother Kaufman said, it is not ethics which produces doctrine, but the doctrine which produces ethics. And of course, the tendency in our religious world is to do what when it comes to those two things? What do they like to skip over? Yeah, they skip over, let's just skip the doctrinal differences. Those aren't important, and let's just focus on uh, those practical applications that we all agree on, on how to live and so forth. The problem, of course, is that you can't really agree on that either. If you don't agree on doctrine, for instance, you know how many religious groups, modern Protestant denominations, will now uh, condone all kinds of sexual immorality. You know, they, they'll, they'll install homosexuals or other... Uh, sexual perverts in, into their own, uh, you know, uh, clergy. And certainly will allow them to be, you know, members without problem and say that that's not a problem. Well, how can we agree on that? Or there's many of these mainline denominations that have no problems with uh, the murder of unborn children. You know, abortion's just a choice. Well, that's because you didn't get the doctrine right and we don't agree on that. So how are we going to agree on, you know, practical application? Um, and so it is important, and one leads to the other. And certainly from Paul's perspective, and I think, the, you know, as you read the New Testament, it's not God's intention, and it wasn't Paul's intention, that Christians uh, live some life of seclusion, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, in a monastery and, and away from the world. But we're to maintain normal relationships in this world, whether they be business or social interaction because um, frankly how else are we going to influence the world how else are you going to be salt and light in the world if you cut yourself off from other people um, it's not the social interaction that we abandon but it does change our views and our values it certainly changes our worldview and it changes therefore our values I like what uh, the Scottish theologian Barclay said 
this will obviously give him, talking about the Christian, a new set of values, when, that is when one becomes a Christian and he makes this transformation. Things which the world thought important he will no longer worry about. Ambition, ambitions which dominated the world will be powerless to touch him. The Christian standard of values will be God's and not men's. And that's the difference between Christians and non-Christians. It's not that we just cut ourselves off and don't associate with people. Um, and there are groups that do that, um, uh, you know, that say, well, I can't, just, we just won't associate. Somehow that will, uh, that'll preserve our godly living. Well, it might or might not, but it certainly will not allow the church and God's people to be the influence that he meant for us uh, to be. So he talks about these, uh, this, some, some very basic fundamentals for Christian living um, as he moves into chapter 3. And we're going to see a lot of the same things that we saw in Ephesians. A lot of the same exhortations and certainly those contrasts. Remember in Ephesians we saw a lot of, you know, this is where you were and this is where you are now. This is what you were. This is what you are now. This is the way you behaved. This is the way you're to behave now. And we're going to see some more of that uh, here in Colossians chapter 3. Um, but let's read... Uh, Let's see, let's just read the first four verses. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, I think the King James says, set your affections. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, uh, then you will also uh, will appear with Him. You also will appear with Him in glory. Well, this first statement is not really conditional. Uh, it's more of a cause and effect. And so really you could read it, since then you were raised with Christ. These people were Christians he was writing to. Since you were raised with Christ, well... And if he's talking about being raised, and I, and I connect that to Romans chapter 6... What's the allusion there to? Hmm? But particularly what act is there an allusion there to? Baptism. Baptism, absolutely. That's how they became Christians. They were buried, right, by baptism. They were immersed in water and they were raised to walk in newness of life. So since you were raised with Christ, um, then what? Two things, right? There's a couple of things I'm told to do. The first one is what? Seek. I'm to seek those things which are above. Uh, Thayer says that Greek word for seek, seek, <laughs> seek, seek, I think it's zateo or something like that, it means to seek in order to find a persistent pursuit. And so I'm going to consistently and persistently pursue those things which are above. Well, what does that mean? If I'm seeking and pursuing things that are above. Hmm? Heavenly things, things that are spiritual in nature, things that are of higher importance, things that are more exalted in, in, as far as principles are concerned. These are the most important things in life that I'm seeking. I'm seeking the things which are above. And notice where what? where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And so we might ask ourselves, Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. So we're told to seek the things that are above where He is. So then the question becomes, well, where do we sit? Where do we find ourselves sitting? Are we sitting in things that are Spiritual, what realm, put it this way, what realm have we taken up our abode? Are we earthly and secular? Are we spiritual and heavenly? Um, I like uh, a contrast that one commentator made. Um, why did Joshua and Caleb in the Old Testament, when they were the only two that came back from, with the spies, or as spies, and reported, why did they remain faithful 
And all the rest of the children of Israel, at least 20 years old enough, did not. What was the difference between them and the others? Okay, their hearts, their minds, their affections, their pursuits were focused where? Well, more, more specifically, where, where was their mind focused? We're to, we're to set our minds and focus on things that are spiritual and heavenly. Where was theirs? And keep in mind types and shadows from the Old and the New Testament. Theirs was on the promised land. Absolutely. Their focus, their, their realm in which their abode was, they were looking at Canaan. Now, you think back to all that had happened up to that point, and all the time the children of Israel murmured to Moses. Up until this last, he said, these ten times you've rebelled. Up until this, finally he had had enough Obviously, where was the hearts of the rest of those people? Egypt. It never left Egypt. They were constantly talking about what? Going back to Egypt. All you've done is bring us out here to kill us. We're thirsty today. Okay, I'll give you water. I'm hungry today. Okay, I gave you something to eat. Is they were always complaining about something, and they were always talking about how much better they had it, and get this, how much better they had it in slavery. Right? Take us back to Egypt. They, they never left Egypt. Their hearts didn't. Only Caleb and Joshua and Moses, although he wasn't allowed to enter. Only their hearts were set on Canaan, on heavenly things, spiritual things, as we would use the type and shadows today. And so uh, it's interesting to me that generally when we talk about types and shadows, that, that Egyptian bondage or slavery then we, we compare to what today? Sin. Our, our bondage, our slavery, our service to sin. And they just didn't want out of it. They wanted to stay in it. That's where their hearts were. But not so with the other two. And so Paul says, you got to seek the things that are above. And keep in mind, too, um, keep in mind that now he's writing to who? Christians. So, and we're going to see that throughout this chapter, but it's not a matter of, okay, when I'm baptized, I, my, spirit, my spiritual state changes, right? I go from lost to saved. I go from being outside of Christ to being in Christ to being a citizen of his kingdom, a member of his church, a, a son, an adopted son. My state changes, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have to do what? Yeah, there's a, but there's a growth process. There's still things that I have to work on. They don't just stop. Oh, well, I'm, I'm never gonna do that again. I'm not gonna be any more temptation. No room for growth. He says, you got to, he's talking to Christians and he says, you seek these things. And then number two, you're going to do what? You're going to set, set your affections, the King James says. That, that Greek word literally means, talks about the mind, to have in mind, to direct one's mind to a thing. So this is a good translation. Set your mind on things above. That's the object. What's the object of my affections? Where am I going to set my mind on things above? And so he said, seek and then set my mind on things above, not on, not on things on the earth. I like the way Brother Waycaster put it in his commentary. You put the two together and you say, in order to successfully seek the things that are above, it is mandatory to set my mind on those things. That's, that's got to be what, I, what I'm about. And, of course, there's this contrast between things above and things on the earth. It reminds me somewhat of 2 Corinthians 4, the latter part of verses 16 through 18, when Paul said, uh, we don't look on the things which are what? We don't look on the things which are seen, but we 
look on the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And so this, it's the difference between a spiritual mindset and an earthly mindset that says, the eye of faith says, I can see things that the human eye can't see because I believe what God has told me. And, and this, this difference between a, a man or woman of God and a man or woman of the world, frankly, that has not changed from the very beginning, from in, in any dispensation, okay? If I go to Hebrews 11.10, what does it say about Abraham? Now, Abraham was a patriarch. Well, what was his mindset? Where did he set his mind? What did he seek? It, Hebrews 11.10 says he looks for what? A city which hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. I've read, sometimes I've read scholars and commentators and sometimes our own uh, uh, teachers who go out and get these degrees, uh, sometimes will let that imbibe into their own teaching um, from modernists. Be very careful. I read stuff where it says, well, people in the Old Testament, people in the patriarchal age, people in the Mosaic dispensation, they didn't really have this... Uh, they weren't seeking, you know, they didn't know anything about the afterlife or things after death. That's just not true. Now, it wasn't as developed as it is in the Christian dispensation. But Abraham, what did Abraham think was going to happen to Isaac? What does the Bible say that Abraham was thinking when he offered his son Isaac? God was going to raise him from the dead. Well, now let me tell you something. If your body, if you die and you're like Rover, dead all over, there's no bodily resurrection, right? But Abraham believed in a bodily resurrection. David, in talking about his infant son that uh, he had by adultery with Bathsheba when that baby died, said what? He won't come back to me, but what? I will go to him. And I read one the other day where somebody said, well, Job didn't know anything about that. That's not true. Job says, my Redeemer lives, and he said, I will see God out of my flesh. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Well, why, why, would, you, <laughs> why would Job say, though he slay me, I will trust him, if once God slayed him, if he just said, well, forget you, God, I've, you know, you've treated me terribly and I've tried to be a good guy, so just kill me. Why would he care if there was nothing after? So these people knew more than we give them credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I'm not saying that uh, they know what we know. I know from the New Testament, I get a lot clearer picture of the Hadean realm, paradise and Tartarus and so forth, and the judgment day and who's going to be the judge and all that. I understand that. That doesn't mean they didn't know anything at all. So, it's been the same in every dispensation. Spiritual people looking beyond this life, looking beyond the material, setting their mind and affections on things above and seeking those things. And what's the motivation for that? For what? Verse 3. You died. You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Well, um, you died, right? The old man died. You buried him. This uh, phrase, your life is hidden with Christ in God, there's several possibilities. I think any of them are possible. Maybe all of them. Who knows? None of them are incorrect. Obviously, um, when my old man is buried, in some sense, that old life, when my sins are removed, that old life is hidden. It's gone. But uh, the other, another way we could look at this, when I become a Christian, then I... You know, as a person of the world, I'm generally self-centered. I'm, I'm the one on the forefront. I'm, I'm number one, right? But when I 
when I become a Christian, who becomes number one? Christ does. I have to move myself to the background, right? And so I'm no longer in the forefront seeking my own things, my own desires, but those of Christ. That's maybe another possibility there. Another one is, obviously, in God, we have our refuge, right? We have our protection from the devil and, and the temptations of this world. And so in that sense, our life could be hidden with Christ and God. So there's a lot of possibilities there. And I don't know that, you know, exactly, or I wouldn't say it's exactly this or that. But there's the second part of the motivation when Christ, uh, now notice what it says here, when Christ, who is our life, appears. You ever heard anybody say, you know, uh, music's his life, or sports is his life, or whatever. What does that mean? If I say something is somebody's life, what does that mean? It's their purpose, isn't it? It's their purpose for living. It's, it's what they love. It's what they want to do. Um, that's their focus. Well, who's our focus? What's our purpose? Who's our purpose? Christ is our life. Reminds you of Philippians 1, 21, right? Paul said what? For, to me, for me to live is what? Christ. For me to live is Christ. And when he shall be, the King James says, manifested or appears, as it says here in the New King James. Um, when he appears. Well, that word that's used there for appears or manifested, revealed is another word you could use. That Greek word is translated, um, oh, I don't know, six or seven times in the New Testament. And every time it's in the context of his second coming. Um, and so when he comes again, then we'll get to partake of that glorious reward that he's promised us. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Well, what effect should Christian doctrine have on my behavior? What effect should it have? According to the rest of this chapter, we're going to look at a few things. Number one, sins of the old life are to be abandoned, right? That's number one. You've got to get rid of the bad and the old before you can add the what? You've got, you got to make some room for the new. The, the new virtues, the virtues of the new life that I'm going to cultivate. And then when you get down to verse 18 and following, family relationships will be strengthened. And then when we get on to the beginning of chapter 4, verses 1 through about 6, religious duties, there are certain requirements of us when it comes to our religion but the first thing it's going to do, it's going to affect on the things that we get rid of from our life and the characteristics and values we add to our life. And, and so the first things he's going to talk about from verses 5 through 11 are the things we're going to get rid of. Um, and so uh, look at, uh, let's read 5 through, well, just 5 through 7. Therefore, put to death, I think the King James says mortify, but that word there means just put to death. Although we know what a mortician is, don't we? Put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We've seen all these things before. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Well, there's that contrast. Like we saw in Ephesians, this is what you once walked in. This is the way you want, the way you once to behave. Um, so, put these things to death, uh, because after all, when you were baptized, that's what you were supposed to be doing. Uh, and yet, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean, like we said before, that these temptations and these passions of the flesh are just going to die and wither and go away and not bother us anymore. Else he wouldn't write this. He's writing to Christians. 
And obviously some of them probably still had problems with these things or he wouldn't be writing to them about it. Um, so there's an, there's an active putting to death that we have to keep doing, these evil propensities. Um, as Barclay said, we kill self-centeredness, private desires and ambitions. It's interesting, he says, put to death your members which are on the earth. That kind of reminds me of Matthew 5. You remember when Jesus said, um, he's talking about various parts of your body, and he said, oh, if your right hand offends you, what? If your right hand is causing you problems, making it difficult for you to live the Christian life, get rid of it. Or if your right eye is your problem, pluck it out, get rid of it. Well, Jesus wasn't teaching self-mutilation. You know, it's a spiritual application. But what he's saying is, you know, you've got to make some changes, and you can't, you can't put yourself in those situations. And you've got to find a way to, to avoid them, and put them away. And we've seen these lists before, fornication, sexual immorality, of, and that's the general of any kind, whether it's adultery or homosexuality, whatever it might be, whatever perversion it might be would be included in that. Uncleanness, again, defilement of the soul, evil thoughts and actions. Um, passions. I think the King James there says inordinate affection. That's from a Greek word pathos, which means passion or passionate desire. Lust, envy, jealousy. Evil concupiscence concupiscence, the King James says. I don't know of too many people that know much about evil concupiscence anymore, but that's evil desire. And then he always gets down to covetousness, which is idolatry. Um, I like what Barnes said in his commentary about covetousness, this inordinate love or affection of money and material things. He said, it is remarkable that the apostle always ranks covetousness with these base and detestable passions. You ever notice that? You're just reading along this list and you're thinking, oh man, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, you know, oh, that's bad, immoral, shouldn't do that. And then covetousness. Well, what's so bad about covetousness? Well, it's like what he said, of all base passions, this is the one that most dethrones God from the heart and the soul. And that's why it's called idolatry. The Greek word pleonexia, we've talked about this word before, basically the desire to have more. But listen, the Greeks themselves defined it as insatiate desire and said that you might as easily satisfy it as you might fill with water a bowl with a hole in it. You're always wanting something. And no matter how much you get of it, it doesn't satisfy. And so Barclay, I like the way he I defined it, said this. Covetousness is ruthless self-seeking. Now listen, if it is the desire for money, it leads to theft. If it is the desire for prestige, it leads to evil ambition. If it is the desire for power, it leads to sadistic tyranny. If it is the desire for a person, it leads to sexual sin. All of these things have as their root cause covetousness. And go back to the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, you got, you know, don't, don't murder and all this stuff. Honor your parents. And then all of a sudden it says, don't covet. Don't covet what? Don't cover your neighbor's animals, his servants, his wife, you know, whatever. It comes in many forms, covetousness does. And so therefore it is idolatry because the desired object of gain we place on the throne of our heart instead of God, right? That's what we want. That's what we think about. That's what we pursue instead of pursuing spiritual things. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Well, people don't like to talk about the wrath of God, but what's the difference between receiving the wrath of God and not receiving the wrath of God, according to this verse? 
what's the pathway to being pleasing to God? Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry said it. It's the opposite of what's in this verse. The pathway to being pleasing with God and avoiding His wrath is obedience. And the path to His wrath is disobedience. And keep in mind now, and we've talked about this before, and we talked about the nature of God. Um, you know, God's wrath is not some human-type emotional uh, hissy fit type of anger, but it's more of a judicial wrath that says, you know, sin requires punishment. It's violated my nature. But he doesn't lose, quote, God doesn't, quote, lose his temper. Or, or like we like to say with people sometimes, he likes to fly off at the handle. God doesn't do that. He's always under control. It's not vindictive. But notice he says, uh, in, once, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So again, we're getting a glimpse of the way they used to live. And he says, that's not the way you're supposed to be living anymore. And, you know, it reminds you of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right? Where he lists, his, he lists these awful sins. And then he says, uh, but such, what? Such were some of you. So what does that tell me? What does that tell me when he can make statements like, uh, wherein you once, once walked, or such were some of you, what does that tell me? But more than that, that, that changed their spiritual state, but what about their thoughts and their behavior? What does that tell me for me or anybody? You can change. People say, I can't change. I was born this way, uh, the Lady Gaga song says. No, you weren't. You can change. You can stop that. It may not be easy. But let me tell you something. Jesus said uh, in Luke, he used that word we've seen before, that Greek word agonizai. Strive to enter in. He literally said agonize to enter in. So he, he didn't say it was going to always be easy. In fact, he said on one occasion, a rich man, it's easier, it's easier for a camel to do what? Go to the eye of a needle. That doesn't sound too easy to me. So, but now... Let's read verses 8 through the rest of this section, 11. But now you yourselves are to put off like clothes. You put off these kinds of clothes, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. So we get this um, list of sins, and we've seen these, other, these lists before, Galatians 5 and so forth. It's interesting to me that these sins have all have some relationship to the tongue in some form or fashion, but they also all have to do with our relationship toward who specifically? Don't tell me God, because I know they're sins. Huh? Our fellow man, right? They, they all have some relationship in how we treat our fellow man, and that would include our brothers and sisters in Christ or people outside of Christ. These words for anger and malice we've talked about before. Anger is more of that um, uh, long-lasting, kind of slow-burn type Wrath is more of that uh, sudden outburst, and then it's over. Uh, but either way, we're to avoid those things. Uh, malice, that evil intent to do harm. It's interesting here, the King James says railing. The New King James says blasphemy, and that is the Greek word blasphemia, 
But generally, when you see the word blasphemy, you think about men speaking ill toward who? God. And that's not what he's talking about here. Not in this list. Not in the context. He's actually talking about evil speaking toward other people. And so I think probably um, some of the other translations, I like slander is used in some. Or railing, I think, is used in the American Standard Version. Slander or railing. And then the American Standard here says shameful speaking. The New King James says filthy language. And that's interesting because uh, Greek scholars are not really in all in agreement on how this Greek phrase should be translated. It can have to do with foul or filthy speech or obscene speech. But it also could have to do with abusive language. And so many modern translations talk about abusive speech. And then one commentator just put the both together and said, well, it's using abusive speech with foul or obscene language. Well, either way, we shouldn't be doing any of it, whether it's foul or obscene language or abusive speech toward other people. Do not lie to one another. You remember what Paul told Titus about the Cretans? One of their own poets said what? They're always what? Liars. Whole cultures can be known as liars. And there are cultures in the world today that are known as liars. And generally, where do you see that? You see it in cultures that have never been touched by the gospel of Christ. You can talk to, I'm not going to name any in particular, but I've dealt with some people from other cultures and they have a habit of lying. It's the way they, it's the way they operate. You talk to Chris Wade, who works for uh, U.S. Customs, and he deals with people from all over the world, and he can tell you readily right off which ones are the most difficult and lie the most. In fact, he told me about one particular nation or culture where they just lie when the truth would be fine. It's just easier to tell the truth. There's no reason to lie, and they just lie because that's what they do. It's just everything comes out of their mouth. Because he has to deal with them on a daily basis. God's, God's, not, God's a God of truth. And where the gospel hasn't gone, you, get a, you have a problem with lying. And it was obviously a common practice in this day and age for these people. Do not lie since you've put off the old man with his deeds. But you put all that off and you're going to put on what? This new man who is renewed in knowledge. Um, notice there's several things we need to get from this. Number one, you put on the new man. In other words, uh, it's a process. There's a process of spiritual growth and maturity. You don't come up out of the baptistry and say, I've arrived, spiritually speaking, or I'm, you know, I've, I've got it all under control. It's a steady process. You're going to have to continue to work on these things. And number two, there's some connection between this renewal and this spiritual growth with knowledge, right? So, I'm going to have to probably spend a little time in the Word of God if I'm going to grow and be the kind of person I ought to be. And notice it's after the image of Him that created us. That knowledge of Christ leads us to imitate Him. We want to be more like Him. As somebody like, you know, as you usually read in commentators, it's like, we want to be like our father, just like, uh, you know, a three-year-old father follows his father around, his dad, and wants to be like him, you know, gets in his shoes and walks around him. Well, that's, that's really what the Christian ought to be about, becoming more like our father and our elder brother. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all in all. You know, it's apparent here, and maybe uh, this is an allusion to the fact that these false teachers and heretics in Colossae were trying to drive wedges between various classes of individuals. We don't have any class warfare today, do we? Pol politicians don't engage in any of that, do they? Put one group against another. And that may have been going on here, but there are no class distinctions in Christ. Life is offered to all. By the way, life is offered to all, and guess what? Um, responsibilities are demanded by all. And 
I like what Kaufman says here. doesn't matter about race, social class, whatever, but I like what Kaufman says. At the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Now listen, not a uniformity of status in the present world order. That doesn't mean, we're not talking about communism or socialism. You may have a lot more money than I do. That's fine in this present world order. That's the way the world works. But in Christ, the ground is level. So it's not a uniformity of status in the present world order, but a change in attitude by which the stigma of being different is loved away. And I can accept those who are different from me, and I can agapao them. Let me finish this real quick, because I want to mention this about the barbarians. We've talked about this before, this idea that the Greeks saw anybody that didn't know Greek language and Greek culture basically was a barbarian. It was a play on this word, Greek word for barbar. -bar. That's the way they talk. They made fun of them. They're rude. They're, they're crude. They're rough. They're harsh. And so any foreigner that wasn't imbibed in Greek language or culture was called a barbarian. But this Scythian, these people from Russia and Siberia, they were known as the wildest and the most savage of the barbarians. And so this was proverbial for them. It just meant, meant a notoriously savage, mean, barbaric people because these were the worst they could think of. And so Paul just throws this in the list, or the Holy Spirit does. Neither, but it doesn't matter whether you're Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, a barbarian, or even a Scythian, slave or free. We're all one in Christ. No class distinctions. All right, we'll pick up verse 12 next week. And maybe I'll have a lapel mic.